legacy to order. Let it be reflect on record that today is Tuesday, March 21st, 2023, room 1150 at uh, 311. And we have uh, on our agenda today, we have about nine bills. Um, we're trying to make it work. I know that some members had bills hearing at the same time and uh, members will go in and out, but we'll make it, we'll make it work. Uh, we also wanna be sensitive with time as well. So we wanna let testify know that we only give them two minutes now uh, before we're accommodating a little overflow uh, beyond two minutes, but now we wanna be uh, strictly two minutes and we'll, we'll time you especially the testifiers, um, and then go from, from there. Uh, we'll try to keep it moving quickly so we can uh, finish this, these, uh, the agenda on time, but at the same time, we want to have a uh, thorough discussion on bills that concern to members. And let the record reflect that we also have quorum at this time. So the first bill on our agenda is Senate File 225, uh, 2250, uh, Senator Kunish, transfer requirement of Upper Sioux Agency State Park. Welcome, Senator Kunish, anytime when you're ready. Good morning, um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. I have uh, for you Senate file 2250, um, this is a relatively simple bill, and uh, what it does is that it transfers, um, this bill would require the Commissioner of Natural Resources to transfer state-owned land within the boundaries of the Upper Sioux Agency State Park to the Upper Sioux community. And um, there is no cost, they, they would receive it at no cost. It requires the Commissioner to identify all the state-owned land in the park and any funding restrictions or other legal barriers to transferring the land by September 15th, 2023, and then to convey the land without restriction by December 1st, 2023. It requires the commissioner to submit a report to the legislature by December 15th of 2023, um, and that will identify all barriers to transferring the land, including any, legislated, any legislation that we would need, need to do down the road to eliminate any of those barriers. And so members, that is my bill before you. And we do have a couple of testifiers. Okay, welcome. Uh, please state your name for the record. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, I don't uh, know the protocols here, and I apologize for coming in That's late okay. time. That's okay. Just say your name. For, I, 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 remember, yep, I remember you from the Sovereignty Day. You gave a very compelling uh, remarks, and uh, now, uh, again, state your name for the record. So. <laughs> my, my name is uh, Chairman Kevin Jensvold. I uh, serve as the tribal chairman for the Yellow Medicine Dakota people. Um, we're a recognized uh, United States CFR uh, 25 as the Upper Sioux community, which is uh, directly correlates to this um, bill that is in front of you today with the Upper Sioux Agency. It is directly uh, attributed to our people and our connection to this land as the original caretakers. I've served as the tribal chairman for the last 18 years. I've uh, been entrusted to be the spokesperson on behalf of our people. It's a difficult day for me and I, I apologize uh, for that. i um, been pulled in a few directions walking in here because this seems to all of a sudden became a controversial um, request. But um, I'm not only here on behalf of the 550 tribal members that I represent, but also all of those future generations that depend upon my words today to compel you to move this bill forward on our behalf. And also all of our ancestors that have um, preceded in this world that's given me the opportunity to live today in the sacred homeland of the Dakota people. Minnesota, 
is a Dakota word. Minishota means the cloudy water. So this has been our homeland forever. This land where you make your laws, original tribal lands, which were um, ceded to the United States in the called the Pike Treaty of 1801, I believe, maybe 1805. But uh, our creation story starts in a place just a few miles from here called Mendota. We call it Bade Dota, where those rivers come together. So we've never came from anywhere other than where we are right now at this moment in time. And we've been here forever. But the genesis of this request comes from a time in 1862 when uh, my mother's people had made an agreement with the United States of America that they would cede 21 million acres of land so that the state of Minnesota would um, be able to be formed ultimately. The payments to the Dakota people were to be distributed at two places, Lower Sioux Agency and Upper Sioux Agency where the Yellow Medicine people are from. And I would encourage all of you, if you don't know the history of this state and how it was formed and the history of the Dakota people to 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 look upon that. It is one of very difficult history, very dark and very painful from our perspective. And, I, and again, I encourage you to look upon that, the mistreatment of my mother's people. But the simple truth just sits there. It is what it is, and neither I nor any of you were there at that time, so none of us can be responsible for what occurred, but the Dakota people were treated in a vicious manner. We were at Upper Sioux Agency waiting on the distribution of the annuities and the goods that were promised by the United States that did not come. In the midst of all of that, our people then became um, decimated by the lack of food, and ultimately, the history shows that starvation occurred right there at that Upper Sioux Agency, waiting for those goods to be um, delivered. And if you do read the history, those goods were siphoned off by unscrupulous uh, you know, settlers and agents and whatnot, and they were never even going to be given to the rightful uh, recipients. So I ask you to think of this state park from a different perspective. The DNR is going to say that it's a place of recreation, and, and I only look at it as a place of um, desperation and despair. I use the word genocide, and I use the word holocaust, because my ancestors died on that land. There are 13 known burial sites on that park known to the United States and countless others known only to the Dakota people. It is our ancestral homeland. We, um, the Yellow Medicine River is on the east side of the, the boundary, again named after our people, reflection of who we were and where we lived. The western half directly it is abuts our uh, tribal lands, that we have today. There is a highway that runs through that land that has, it was Highway 67. It um, sloughed off the side of the hill. It is now um, decommissioned and it's created the uh, dissection of, of that park. And that is one of the catalysts for this request is that park is now in, in uh, cannot be um, accessed only through tribal lands on the west side because the bridge on the Yellow Medicine River will be de decommissioned at some point in the near future by the uh, um, Department of Transportation. The significance of that land is not only a place of, 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 of death and despair of the 1862, but it holds historical significance prior to that places of, of celebration and prayer and courtship and death. 
all of those places at the confluence of the Minnesota River and the Yellow Medicine River were were our places where our people lived for 10,000 years. And that's the reason that that uh, Highway 67 could not be relocated. There's just too many traditional sites that would be impacted for them to attempt to relocate the road and to be able to access the uh, eastern campground. And so at some point in the near future, it'll be an impossibility. And that is the request I have today on behalf of our people is that you would make that consideration in order for them to get there they have to go through three miles of tribal land and i ask you to only hold one picture in that if you see a picnic table scattered amongst that park i ask that you remember those are the same places that my ancestors some um, succumbed to starvation different time in a different place but yet, um, the Creator has brought us here today. And maybe there's a possibility that um, across these lines and these boundaries that have separated the Dakota people, the original inhabitants and the, the immigrants, is we can't change the past, but maybe there's an opportunity here for us moving forward to, to say that we did something something different from our ancestors that um, validated all humanity, that made it relevant that the, we are all created equal under the eyes of God, and however we view that. I ask for your consideration to understand the powerful impact and the solemn um, respect that we have for the upper agency park. It is not a place for recreation it is a battlefield, it is a concentration camp, it is a place of death and destruction of my mother's people and the Dakota culture as we knew it at the time. I heard the governor say, you know, that he wants one Minnesota and I think that if it's going to be one Minnesota it needs to in also include the first Minnesotans. The governor accompanied uh, myself and our tribal council to Washington, D.C. because there's encumbrances on this um, property. We went to talk to the National Park Service to lend our, our um, assistance to the state of Minnesota to get assurities that um, these encumbrances would be um, um, the timelines. I believe there's a one-year timeline for replacement um, recreational um, parklands that they would consider, and there is a letter available that they would be willing to work on that timeline for indeterminate up to uh, three years, I believe. So we've helped pave the way to make this happen and make it a reality. Um, I apologize for my disconnect. Like I said, I was um, confronted outside and because I understand that there's uh, been some uh, discourse. I want to address one set of testimony that you may be aware of, it comes from the Friends of the Upper Sioux Park, and they do almost bolster our argument that they're, they're, they're taking offense, that they are unaware of, of what has occurred, and that they are concerned that they have places to recreate. And um, again, the DNR has assured us that um, they will replace those lands so that the uh, citizens of Minnesota will have that opportunity moving forward. And um, I think that um, the Friends of the Park, uh, the gentleman's name is Dave Smigluski. He is the chairman of that foundation, but he is also the um, mayor of a neighboring town. He was also at one time the editor of the local newspaper. And in his testimony, which I would directly refute, he states he was unaware until just the last year or two that um, this was a potential. I told him 18 years ago of our intent, so I, I just want to put that out there for the record. And I haven't had the opportunity to um, challenge him um, directly, but I want that to be known in, in, in this, um, this uh, testimony. So I uh, thank you for your time. I know I've probably left out a lot. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you, Chairman Joe, Joe Ball. Um, I, I did I did say that you know uh, with respect of time, but uh, with respect of you, Chairman Joe Ball, um, your people Lakota and Ojibwe as well have been muffed from uh, society for hundreds of years, you know, and uh, being a member of the First Nation, and this is your country, and so I I you know respectfully give you the time as much as you 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 like to tell the story. That's you know so, um, and but Mr. Bob Meyer, I would not let you do the same. So, <laughs> Mr. So, Chairman, we'll, we'll we'll stay with the with the two minutes. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Joel, for being here for with your testimony. Mr. Chairman, yeah. members, I will try to be as brief as I can, as many of the points have already been made by the chairman here. And what an honor to be sitting here with two chairmen and all of you again in this room. Commissioner Stroman wishes she was able to be here today, but unfortunately she's tied up in other commitments. Uh, this is a long-standing request that we've been working on with the Upper Sioux community. For the record, I'm sorry, Bob Meyer, Department of Natural Resources Assistant Commissioner. And we have been working with the Upper Sioux Agency and the governor on this, on this specific request. Uh, the park was established in 1963 contains 1,280 acres along the Minnesota, Minnesota River, and it was established to preserve and interpret the agency site, and as we've heard, provide recreational opportunities in the Minnesota River. It is the homeland of the Dakota people and a place of very cultural significance, high cultural significance. Uh, Upper Sioux Agency, as we've heard, has a somber history, and there are Dakota member burial sites within the park boundaries. We take these issues very seriously, and this is what leads us to this position. That is the right thing to do to, to work transferring, to work towards transferring this asset back to its rightful owners. Uh, we have worked, been working with, with the Federal Park Service, or I should say the Department of Interior and the National Park Service on this issue. There is funding within the current bonding bill that the House has passed on the Senate floor that does contain the money to defease the bond payments that are on the property. And we are working through that process and also working with the federal government on the Land and Water Conservation Fund encumbrances on there. Uh, it's going to be a long process, one that will take us several years. But this is the beginning step to provide that le legislative authorization, the legislative intent to pursue the transfer then once we get to the point of identified lands, working on where those law county encumbrances can go, we will need to come back to the legislature to deauthorize the state park and statute, and then authorize a transfer of that riparian parcel to the band. That will probably be done most likely as a standalone bill, or it could be done in one of our lands bills that are there. Uh, we've been working on the, the, the fund encumbrance issues, and with the federal government, as I said, um, there are several next steps that can be out that will be outlined in this report, but the first will be a land survey and then an appraisal to continue on with that, those fund encumbrances. There's one point in the bill I would just like to address really quickly. The language on lines 1.10 and 1.11 that says land without <laughs> restrictions or barriers shall be conveyed by December 1st, 2023. In our research, there's very little land that isn't, is not encumbered and it wouldn't, wouldn't be fiscally prudent to transfer what we've identified as about an acre or so of land. So we'd like to work with the author and the legislature to, to determine what is that pace of land transfer, but also recognizing the, the costs that are associated with that. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we fully endorse and support this proposal. We are in the process of a, a statewide engagement, local, local units of government, and, and citizen engagement as well. We spoke with Senator Lang and I recently spoke with Senator Dames about it as well. So uh, we believe this is the right thing to do. We want to work with Minnesotans to, to help them understand and also to identify the replacement recreational lands and make sure that everybody can, can be made whole and recognize the commitments that we've had. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Any questions from members? Senator Green? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As always, I have some questions. <clears throat> if, uh, specifically to Assistant Commissioner Myers, um, you know how I feel about public lands. I, I think we have way too many in the state right now. And so whether the, whether the lands belong to a tribal organization or the state, they're still public lands. One of the things that bothers me here is that now you're going to be looking for and purchasing another 1,200 acres to replace what we've got here. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Senator Green, the replacement is actually based upon value, not acres. 
So we're assuming that the land is approximately three to four million dollars worth of value, and that's why it's critical to have that appraisal done as a first step to understand what our replacement needs are going to be. Senator Mr. Green. Chair, and so um, with the land values that, that they are and the surrounding uh, acreage there, what is the value of the surrounding land in the Upper Sioux region per acre? Uh, Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Senator Green, I do not have that information at hand. We can certainly look at land values and get back to you. I don't know if Senator Lang may have more information on that since he, in a different life, managed a lot of those <laughs> lands. So, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it, it varies is, is the easy question. So our recent land auction was 17.4 plus a 6% buyer's premium per acre now. That doesn't constitute what the River Valley, oftentimes there's a lot of tax forfeited property within the River Valley, on both the uh, Yellow Medicine, the Redwood side and the Renville County side. Um, this is gonna be a tough one because I don't think that's land value that the, if, correct me if I'm wrong, that's land value we're talking about. It doesn't have to do with, uh, and, and, and Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Meyer, maybe a better, uh, a starting point here, maybe a, a clarification of the committee on what exactly the state park constitutes as far as camping sites, horse sites, uh, access to the river environment. I think maybe that, um, not besides the 1,200, 1,400 acres of land, there also is a substantial amount of uh, uh, buildings, uh, fences, tarred road, things like that. Maybe, that. maybe start there because you probably couldn't value-wise go off of, of ag land up on top of the bluff line, nor could you go off of uh, property value that is in the River Valley itself because largely it's uh, not agricultural land, it's hunting land, more or less. So. Sam, are you clear? Th thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I think I, th I heard you say $3 million is what you estimate this 1,200 acres to be worth, which doesn't even sound unless I heard you wrong, doesn't even sound uh, reasonable. Uh, so the only other question for you, Mr. Myers, is would this hurry things up if we could get legislation passed that we wouldn't have to replace this land? Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Senator Green, the, the, the value is just an estimate. It's three to $5 million, roughly say. Uh, part of the, the situation is of the lowlands in our campgrounds flood often. Our buildings, our visitor center is closed at this park because of disrepair and it, it actually needs to be taken down and, and rebuild a new one if we were going to do that actually. I would assume the cost would be prohibitive to fix it. Um, but looking at those comparatives as what needs to be done and, and we talked with Senator Lang yesterday in a meeting, how do we find other recreational opportunities in that area to enhance or provide and then also can we find replacement lands in that area or it, it can be actually statewide. So that issue is there, but we want to make sure that we maintain the recreational benefits that are going to be lost somehow in the area. Um, as to your second part of the question, it's a federal requirement that those lands be replaced. Uh, so I, I do not believe there would be an action that this body or, or the legislature here could take to exempt us from that federal land and water conservation requirement on the replacement lands. So, Senator, Mr. Please. Chair, then, uh, then this will for sure be the last one then uh, but you, you've already said that you've gone out and, and spoken to the folks in DC. So there is, there is a, a, an avenue to take to go and get a, a carve out, I would think, in this, in this particular case especially, to say uh, we don't really need to replace the, the 1,200 acres. So I, I would think that that would be, an, would be an option if that's an impediment. Mr. Meyer, you want to comment? Or Mr. Question? Chairman, Senator Green, those conversations were involved the governor and the tribal uh, officials. The DNR was not involved in those conversations. I can follow up, but I am pretty sure that the, the Department of Interior and the Land and Water Conservation folks would not allow for that exemption, but we will certainly reach out and, and see what we can find out. Okay. Any further discussion from members? Senator Lane. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Kunish, you know, you, you initially you talked about that there is no cost, and this is a simple bill, and I, I would say that those are two very untrue statements because this is not simple when we're talking about turning three to four million dollars of uh, property in this, in this case back to 
you know, what is what is largely owned by the state of Minnesota. Every Minnesota sitting in this room, every including the Upper Sioux Agency, uh, owns that property now, and it's a, it's a valuable asset not only because of what it is, you know, and I talked to uh, Commissioner Meyer yesterday about this, and I appreciate the time, that some sort of a partnership between the DNR and the agency would make a lot of sense to me. Um, but I'm holding in my hand here a 19-page fiscal statement. Could you just talk about that a little bit and tell me what, why we're talking about $6 million uh, DNR and $2 million trunk highway fund? Is that what you're putting this against for Highway 67, or is there more to it than that? Because there's there's a lot of dollar bills going on in this fiscal note that's hard to digest here sitting at the table. Senator Kunish or Mr. Meyer? I'd ask Mr. Meyer to address that. He's better at that. Mr. Chairman, uh, better at that, and I, I wrote parts of this, so it probably is helpful to do that. Mm -hmm. So the, the costs outlined in the bill in the in the fiscal note actually outlined the entire cost of the, the, the transfer for not only the department, but the uh, department or the historical society as well as part of this is, is managed there. And the bulk of it are the replacement costs estimated. The expenditures of the highway fund, um, I am not familiar with, but I'm just trying to get to that portion here, as they will not be rebuilding that road. Um, so just give me a second here. So the cost of, of the major cost of this, it looks like, is the bulk of purchasing that easement that the road was built off of, uh, that Highway 67 that is now being unencumbered, I should say, uh, and purchasing that from the landowners and dealing with the road and the removal costs. The rest of it, the, the costs that are associated, uh, though they're tracked in 24, would be in further out in the bienniums. Um, you can see. We're tracking costs in, in 24, and then for the 25, they're still at the same amount. But our intentions would be that we would need to reimburse or find those replacement lands within some time frame, as we discussed with whatever the federal government will allow. Um, there may be other opportunities to look at acquisition proposals that are moving through the legislature to do some of that as well. Um, but our first and primary need is to try to make the community whole or the area whole, and that's what our future conversations will be discussing. Senator Knight. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, yeah, I mean, it looks like it, it has savings in here, but it doesn't have, from, from my vantage point, it's $13, $14 million, give or take, for the cost of the agency. I'm assuming that's give or take over the next biennium. Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if it's that high, but we can certainly spend some time and go through the fiscal note with you. I'd appreciate that opportunity so we have a better understanding. And okay. Mr. Chair, I, I guess, um, you know, I was contacted. I, I, this is not my district. I live just across the river. Um, but Senator Dames was notified by me after I called him and said, do you know anything about this bill? Um, and, uh, you know, I, was all, I found out when the paper called me. Uh, so the, he was also happens to be the, the news reporter happens to be a member of the Friends of Upper Sioux Park, uh, along with the mayor that have spent you know significant, significant amount of time. And I, I just have a tough time uh, understanding why. And this is being said, too, that members of the Upper Sioux Agency itself were unaware of what was going on when this has been going on, for what I understand, for several years. Now, I, I sort of have an issue with that when it's not done with full transparency. Um, if this asset to our area is going to be turned back to the tribe, then I think it does need to be replaced because I spent many years down in that river valley working very hard with horse uh, enthusiasts and camp, campground folks. And I, I guess, Mr. Meyer, could you just explain to me uh, how many sites, uh, what the annual revenue is from that site? Um, what that campground actually looks like to the state of Minnesota, because it is a state park. It's an asset to everybody in the state. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Senator Lang, and, and I can get maps for the park to distribute to that I can share with the committee as well. Uh, the park contains a number of campsites. It is a horse camping area. There are horse trails there. 
I believe there's roughly 60 or so campsites in the area. There's approximately 35 to 38,000 visitors in the past years. Now, some of that has decreased with the road on Highway 67, <coughs> granted, but there is still, it's a recreational opportunity in the area and in, in a part of the state where we do not have a lot of state lands in, in southwestern Minnesota, so I, I understand and, and we fully recognize that, that impact to the area and it's one that we want to work on mitigating. And it, it's first and foremost to some of our conversations as we move forward. But it is a recreational opportunity. There are people that recreate there, but it is also a very somber, very culturally important land to the Dakota people as well. And, and Mr. Chair, I, I think it's important that, and I know I mentioned this to you yesterday, Mr. Meyer, that uh, that's not lost on me. It truly isn't. Um, and I, I, it's by no means, shape, or form an easy thing for the agency to try to weave this line. Um, you know, the <laughs> if you would have came to me and said, you know what, we've worked with the city of Granite Falls, we've worked with the, the agency, we've worked with the tribe, and we're all in agreement, we think we have a plan to do this, but this is, we don't really even have permission to do this as of right now, unless the Department of Interior says it's okay, the state of Minnesota foots the bill to replace the, the lost, I don't know what the revenue is, but maybe that's not so important, but that recreational activity, I mean, we've spent you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on the Sard Sams. Uh, we spent you know, millions of dollars trying to have a Minnesota River uh, recreation plan put together to get a trail for, to go from Upper Sioux to Lower Sioux. Uh, we've worked hard for many years to increase recreational activity in the River Valley, which I believe is truly underutilized. It truly is. It's a, it's a gem, Southwest Minnesota, uh, when you come from the prairies and look down at the River Valley and you, you don't realize it's there until you're there. Um, I, 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 I'm a little concerned and I think it also sets a precedent uh, the state of Minnesota, um, I don't know, giving back 4,000, or excuse me, $4 million of property um, is a tough thing, especially when you have such historic, historical significance. But there's a lot of historical significance in the River Valley. Birch Cooley Battlefield comes to mind uh, right away, where there's a campground right next door that's county owned. Um, I think it adds to the experience. If anybody's ever been to that battlefield down there, the partnership that the Historical Society and the county has together to, to shine some light on that, um, that's something I'd like to see with the agent, both the Upper Sioux Agency and the DNR. That'd be something interesting to see. Mr. Chair? Yes, Senator um, Kunish. I'd just like to make a statement and then um, the chairperson. Um, Go ahead, Senator I, I, I just have to say I take offense to that in that these are sacred lands. These are burial grounds of the ancestors. And to think that it's more valuable to be a recreation center than to honor the historic lands of our ancestors and those that have gone before us, I find that very, very offensive. And how do you put, how do you put dollars on those burial mounds? that you're gonna buy or you're gonna give back to the tribes that were, were theirs. And if it's a battlefield, honestly, should we be using that for recreation? People died there. Genocide happened there. And the fact that people are bemoaning uh, recreational loss, that's just not right. And so I think chair, um, the chairman would like to speak as well. Chairman Jamal. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, I, I only want to respond to uh, a few of the comments, one about um, the mayor of, of Granite Falls not um, knowing, I, like I, I made a statement um, before, he's known for 18 years. As far as the uh, members of the Upper Sioux community, um, They've known for 18 years as well that I've served as tribal chairman that this is one of the um, the uh, requests that I've made to three different administrations, uh, Governor Palenti, Governor Dayton, as well as now Governor Walls. As far as the value of that land uh, in our neighborhood, a pasture land is about $1,200 an acre. I made that known to the DNR. I don't know that you could qualify floodplain 
or river uh, or ravines or whatnot uh, as pasture land, but I would think that that would be a, a most generous some um, classification to that land. It is not agricultural. There is no um, ag going on there, but um, it is National Ag Day, so I appreciate those farmers. As far as uh, uh, the dollars, um, the Upper Sioux community um, in 2013 gave $2.7 million, no questions asked, to the Minnesota Department of Transportation for a reclamation uh, uh, project on Highway 67. We recently gave $50,000 to the city of Granite Falls for to enhance one of their park uh, uh, systems uh, in, in town. So I, I don't think that is about the money again in, in it is not about being deceitful or or, or, or or trying to hide anything. This has been open for 18 years, and for people to suggest that it's anything other than that, I disagree with that um, allegation. Whether it's the mayor or the neighboring um, communities of the Upper Sioux community, this has been a request that's been given, and if you can go back on those records, I'm sure you'll find that from... Uh, Palenti administration forward. Um, as far as uh, the value of that land, the 1,200, 1,400 acres, that's point, or it's 67 millionths of 1% of the 21 million acres that was uh, um, taken from the Dakota people to form this, this state. Our original reservation was 10 miles on either side of the river, the Minnesota River, from New Alm all the way up to Big Stone Lake. So anybody who lives 10 miles either side of the Minnesota River is living on our original reservation land, not the land given by the United States, but reserved by the Dakota people for our perpetuity. Uh, again, a treaty that was disrespected and dishonored by United States of America. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chairman. All right, uh, we will... A voice from the audience? Yes, please come forward. And let it be known that this, uh, this is the first stop of this bill and it's going to travel to transportation. And, you know, so um, with the sake of time, uh, we, you know, perhaps if it's related to transportation, we'll, you know, some member can wait till it get there. Uh, please state your name for the record and welcome. Thank you, Chair. Members, my name is Stephanie Chappell. You have testimony from me in your packets, and today I feel imperative that I speak today on behalf of the descendants of more than 650 civilians who died, were murdered in August 1862. That entire area is burial grounds. More than 400 have no burials that we can find as descendants. We know they're there. People bump into them on occasion. They're all documented. Burial parties from the army went out and buried them weeks after. The problem with this bill is that once it is turned into Indian trust, Minnesota has no legal recourse or no legal obligation to allow people on that land. It, is, it will be turned over to private ownership and under 307.08, the Cemeteries Act, it is up to the landowner to give permission for someone to cross. There is no way to hold any sort of commemorative or religious ceremony. And the Upper Sioux Agency inside that state park, there are historic buildings still standing. There are the remnants. The Minnesota Historical Society this summer plans to do archaeology digs to see what else can be found, not just indigenous, but also the Euro-American settlement. It was not originally planned to be one that tried to change a culture. They had lived together side by side. They had intermarried before 1851. It was only in 1862 that things came to a head. All treaties, 51 and 58, were abrogated on August 17, 1862, when four Dakota murdered five Euro-American settlers who were unarmed. That abrogated all treaties. Aside from the treaties, the Iowa 
tribe of Kansas and Nebraska can be traced to the area and they would be the rightful <coughs> tribe to return the property to. I offer you more information. Please contact me. On behalf of descendants of the 400, the 650, and the 400 who have yet to be found, please don't change this from state property. At least as long as we can access it from the West, there are commemorative events, there are religious ceremonies that take place there, just as they used to at the Lower Sioux Agency, which was turned over to private property under a lie given to you in, in 2017 that said it was for operation as an historic site. It was not. The DNR transferred the property and took that information and told the National Park Service that it was for Indian trust. It means that it's private ownership and descendants cannot freely visit their loved ones and the place where their loved ones died. Please don't do this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, members, are we, Sarah Kunish, maybe you can uh, give closing remark and we move this bill forward to the transportation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We've had a very lively discussion and um, I've learned quite a bit about the history of a small piece of land and when I said this is simple and not costly, it obviously was not the correct conversation or statement that I should have made at that time. Um, but nonetheless, I would ask that you would consider this for, um, uh, to move it on to transportation and, and move it on so that we can return the lands to the, to the tribe. Okay. All right. Um, Sarah McEwen, would you just, uh, member of this committee, would you move Senate File 225 to be recommended to pass or refer to Transportation Committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Uh, Senator McCune moved that Senate File 225 be recommended to pass and be, be referred to the Committee on Transportation. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No. Okay. Motion prevail. Division, Mr. Chair. Division. All right. So. Okay, all those in favor, uh, raise their hand. Mary? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we have an online um, uh, members as well. Um, is that Senator Morrison? Okay. You count? Okay. Uh, Senator Morrison, can please stay where you are, and uh, we need to spot you on camera while we do the counting. She's able to hear us. I can hear you, Mr. Chair. Okay. I apologize, Mr. Chair, what was the question? Okay, the question is, we, we are a motion to uh, pass Senate File 225 to Transportation Committee, and uh, the request was division, meaning we want a show of hands uh, of members, and I know you're not feeling well, and, but uh, we need to get, uh, we need to, we need to get uh, information on where you are. I'm sure you're in Minnesota, so we're comfortable. You're in Minnesota, right, Senator? Hey, Mr. Chair. Yes, yeah. Mr. Chair, I am in Minnesota. Could you, could you remind the, the committee what the rule on root voting remotely via division is? I let Mr. Stanley state that point. Mr. Chair, members, um, I'm not entirely sure that this is handled the exact same way in every committee. So I can, if you want to give me a minute or two, I can try to get you an answer to that question. I would need a minute or two. Okay. All right. So should we have a whole, can we put the member offline? Nope. Oh. Just one minute. Okay. Senator Hauschild just returned. Okay. We need to raise our hand. Uh, so you, you got to count it. Right? <laughs> Okay. 
You got it, right? Do we need the clerk? We got the count? Okay. okay. Yes, uh, Senator Morrison, can you state your name for the record and where, where you are? Okay. Yeah, Senator uh, Eichhorn. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you the I, same and say, thing. I think I think your issue is solved with with uh, Senator Housechild being here, but I would like uh, for Council to let us know because I my my understanding, at least from discussions we've had on the floor, is you are unable to vote remotely in a division situation. So we, I think if we could clarify that, I, don't, I know you don't have it now, but if we could clarify that for later, that would be helpful from council. Sure. And, and what, um, should we get a count of nay as well before we proceed? Okay, let's, uh, let's show a hand count of nay. Okay, all right. And we'll <coughs> ignore the uh, remote count. So let the record show that we have five yes and four nay, uh, motion prevail. After this, uh, Mr. Stanley, can you explain uh, the inquiry from uh, Senator Lane earlier? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, I've, I've had a little discussion with uh, some of my colleagues about this question. This has come up before. I should state initially that what happens on the floor is not necessarily, does not necessarily govern the process and committee with respect to this particular question is the first point. The second point is, like I said earlier, I know that some committees don't favor allowing remote division. Some do, and I'm not aware of anything in the rules that would prohibit it. An alternative in the future, if this arises, would be to just uh, request a roll call, and then there's no, there's no question about this. Senator Icorn, okay, good. Senator Hoffman, do you have a No, Mr. Chair, it's just that the, the, you know, requesting a roll call is that it, he answered the question that I was going to ask on, on uh, procedurally. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Well, motion does, did prevail. Senate file 225 is now headed to the Transportation Committee. And thank you, Senator Kunish. Next on the agenda, um, and again, we we're still trying to stay within two minutes for uh, testifier. We want to make it work for members because some members will have to go to a different committee to vote or to present their bill. Uh, Senator Kunish, uh, 2458, please, uh, Enforcement Authority Modification. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an amendment, the A1, and um, it's just some uh, basic um, editing and, and clarification language, and this was done in conversation with the League of Minnesota Cities. So welcome to the table. Um, please uh, state your name for the record and you may proceed. Uh, who, um, whoever. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, I'm Katie Smith, Director of the Ecological and Water Resources Division at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. 
Um, the DNR plays an important role in ensuring sustainable water use through its water permit programs, information collection and analysis, education, technical assistance, and enforcement. Compliance with the state's water laws and permit programs is necessary to protect natural resources and ensure the best use of Minnesota's water resources. The permit programs provide for equity and fairness among water users, applies the best available information to inform permit decisions, and provides protections for water quantity, quality, and ecological benefits. Non-compliance with water laws, particularly in the times of drought, threaten the sustainability. DNR's existing enforcement authorities are insufficient to address serious or repeat violations of state water laws. Changes to DNR's existing limited authorities would help DNR to ensure our water supply is protected and hold violators accountable using a variety of compliance tools. The DNR has the authority to issue administrative penalty orders, or APOs, with monetary penalties up to $20,000 for appropriating water without the necessary permit. However, the penalty amounts are specifically dictated in statute. The $20,000 limit is too low to deter violators, and the penalties must be forgiven if the violations are corrected. This proposal would give DNR greater discretion for calculating penalties, increase the APO cap to $40,000, and require penalties to be paid for violations that are serious or repeat. The APO is a tool that allows for a limited penalty amount and can be only be used for situations where corrective actions can be completed within 30 days. Other compliance tools, such as those used by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, would give DNR new authority to enter into schedules of compliance, stipulation agreements, and other actions to compel performance. These tools can be applied to a variety of situations, those that don't warrant a penalty, those needing prolonged corrective action timeframes to resolve, those that would benefit from negotiations with a permittee, and those so egregious that they warrant higher penalties. So this proposal would give DNR the authority to investigate, require tests and information to be provided, and then use, use the appropriate tool to achieve compliance with water appropriation laws, work in public waters, and other laws governing waters of the state. The DNR also proposes that duty of candor language is enacted, prohibiting parties from knowingly providing false information or failing to provide information the person knows is necessary for the DNR to make decisions to administer these water programs and laws. For the most serious violations, such as those that have harmed or may harm natural resources, repeated violations, or where economic benefit is gained, the DNR is seeking authority to assess civil penalties up to $10,000 per day of violation. These penalties would be assessed through tools such as a stipulation agreement that are not limited by a maximum penalty amount and provide for a negotiated settlement with the violator. The bill also allows for willful or negligent violations of these water programs to be referred by DNR to law enforcement agencies for investigation. We think those situations would be very rare. The DNR feels these enhancements of authorities and tools would help ensure our water resources are protected and available for future generations of Minnesotans. Um, we are aware of uh, stakeholder concerns, specifically the Irrigators Association, and we're committed to continue to work cooperatively to address those. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, next is uh, uh, Carison. Ms. Carison. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Noelle Saracen. I Sarah. am the political or political manager. Sorry, that's a newer title for me. Um, from MN350 and MN350 Action, water is a very important resource, and we use it constantly without even really noticing it. We kind of treat it as though it's this free, indefinite resource, um, and it is a use that every Minnesotan needs and relies on. I myself have chosen Minnesota as my home, but I am from a rural town out west that has seen severe droughts, and I've lived in a small town back east when I went to school that had major flooding from hurricanes. So I've seen firsthand what happens in small rural communities when water resources are under threat from climate change. Um, when major weather events cause flooding or drought, it causes these difficult questions to come up. It's a question of how do we allocate water resources? How do we use water resources? And what usually ends up happening is larger farms like, say, Monsanto, who can drill indefinitely until they reach the right amount, take all the water they need, and then the smaller farmers are the ones that are left to suffer, and they're usually the ones that are following the permit obligations. And that is often what happens in the case that we have right now, where our 
penalties are only $20,000. Smaller farms, they can't afford that. Bigger farms, it's actually a cost-benefit analysis for them if they don't bother to remedy the issue and just occasionally pay a penalty. Um, I bring this up because these are going to be bigger and bigger questions as climate becomes an issue, as we have more drought, as we have more, more flooding. These are going to be the questions we have to wrestle with. And so, um, and that is going to be happening a lot sooner than a lot of us think. The Intergovernmental Panel, Panel on Climate Change has said that by early 2030s, we are going to have 1.5 Celsius degrees warmer weather than we previously have had. Um, we need to start making sure we're allocating these things fairly. We need to make sure that small farmers aren't getting left behind in these issues. We need to make sure that private well owners don't have to keep drilling when they can't afford to, because it is a costly thing to do. Um, and we can start now by making sure that permits are being used across the board and that we are enforcing them and that we are wrestling with these big questions of water usage now rather than in the future when we have bigger problems to have to contend with when it comes to water allocation. And um, you don't even have to look too far in the future. You can actually look recently. In the city of Blaine, they accidentally used too much water. They actually opened several um, wells that they didn't need have a, didn't have a permit for it. They thought they did and they didn't. It caused private well owners to lose their water supply in places like Ham Lake, in places like Lino Lakes, in small rural parts of Blaine. So we really do have problems when people are using more water than they are, than they are permitted to. And so I just wanted to put that out there that um, these are important issues and if everybody's using their permits, Fairly, if everybody is adhering to their permits, we can keep it where water is fair and equitable and we're not putting any of the small farmer Minnesota way of life stuff that we all love about this state and putting that on the back burner for corporations that can actually afford it. So I'd like to thank you for allowing me to speak. I recognize this is a very busy time in session and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Sarison. Okay, next is uh, Tony Colas, uh, Irrigators Association, Minnesota. Mr. Chair, Doug Carnival, McGranche Carnival Law Firm, pinch hitting for Tony Coolis, along with Ann Brazy, who's the president of the Minnesota Irrigators Association. Okay. Uh, we wanted to spend a few minutes, if you, if you will, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Anna is exactly the kind of person that uh, the previous testifier was talking about owns a family farm, as are most of the people in the Irrigators Association of Minnesota. We're the folks who raise the food on, in Minnesota, but we need the resource. We need water or else our products and our, our crops cannot grow. Trust me, they, they do not use intentionally more water than they need. They recognize the resource is valuable and must be protected. Um, we understand that this bill was prompted by a, an event that occurred by a major international company that breached one of the aquifers, non-permitted uh, company, um, and yet this bill has been drafted instead of a solution to solve that problem, but a bill that applies to all folks who use water in Minnesota and have permits from the DNR, like Ms. Brazy and other small irrigators. Um, the draft itself um, is very broad and has uh, lots of situations that might be, must be addressed, and I'll just mention a few because I know your time is limited. The fines that are currently in statute for overusing water above your permit max out at $20,000, and there's an, a, a, a provision in there that gradiates the provisions, so you, if you have a minor violation, it's $1,000, uh, a moderate one at $10,000, and a severe one at $20,000. This bill eliminates those gradations of fines and puts in a $40,000 penalty that can be uh, assessed against any farmer, no matter whether that farmer uses one gallon more or 1,000 gallons more. So they've eliminated these gradations and simply given the discretion to the, to the agency. More importantly, it provides information, or excuse me, uh, 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 provisions in the bill that are drafted out of the PCA uh, enforcement mechanisms that permits the agency to bring criminal prosecutions against farmers like Anna uh, who violate their permits. And it doesn't matter under the statute that's being proposed whether they've appropriated 
one gallon more or a thousand gallons more. And frankly, the only reason that they would do that is if they needed the water because of a drought. And the bill does not provide any exemption for farmers who need more water for their crops if there's a drought. There's no protections in the bill to defend yourself on that score or to exempt fo folks from that score. Now, in fairness, we've been working with the DNR to try and resolve some of these issues. I don't think it's in the, their intent to try and uh, put burdens on small farmers, but I can tell you it is very difficult for folks in the irrigation world who are raising crops to sleep at night when they're seeing things like $40,000 of penalty and potential criminal prosecutions uh, with respect to uh, potential violations. If I might, Mr. Chair, I think I've used my time. I'd last yes. ask Anna to make a few remarks. Yes, please state your name for the record and welcome. Hi there, my name is Anna Brazy, and I operate my family farm in Rice, Minnesota, so I'm in Benton County. Um, we're a fourth generation family farm and we prioritize sustainable regenerative agriculture and conservation of natural resources. Uh, we're also a certified Minnesota egg water quality producer. Uh, we grow food like potatoes, kidney beans, peas, and corn. Um, and I also serve on the board of the Irrigators Association of Minnesota. And as uh, Mr. Carnival mentioned, you know, we understand the intention of this bill is to hold repeat violators responsible for, for their actions. Uh, by and large, this is not small fa farms like mine, my family farm, and, and for the most part, 96% of the time, farmers are within compliance on their permits. That's from the DNR's um, information. Um, that, and that's over 20 years. So the exception, of course, is a drought year when we've made the investment, um, the crops are growing, and then it becomes dry. And absolutely, we need to protect natural resources and we need to feed our state. And we don't want to be in a position where we have to import all of our food uh, from countries that I, I would assume have similar water problems. So again, we have been working with the DNR or making suggestions to the DNR about how this could be a little bit more palatable for farmers. Uh, they claim to be wanting to work with us, but we have not seen that partnership come to fruition. Uh, again, uh, the main concerns for us on this bill are the fines and the criminal penalties. Uh, again, we don't think this is really the intention to send a bunch of farmers like me to jail, um, and, and we hope we'll consider uh, something that could um, amend that for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're Thank you very much. We'd appreciate uh, your consideration, and I should mention this bill has not been heard in the Agriculture Committee where we think it would be appropriate. Happy to take any questions. Sure. Question from members. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'd just like to make a statement. Uh, you know, farmers are farmers are stewards of the land. They, and thank you for being a farmer, um, feeding us. They, you know, they want to take care of the land. They don't want to do what's bad for the land, and they're going to do whatever they can to, you know, protect their the land. So, um, and I, you know that too. So we we'll, we'll work. I hope we can work with them to make this work for them. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Green. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Sen Senator. Ack Okay, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions. Um, first, I'll make a statement to, to the testifiers. I, I disagree with you. I think the DNR does want to put you out of business. Uh, I have watched, I've watched this stuff go on for years. Um, <clears throat> to, the, to the author of the bill, on uh, page 4, uh, line 26 and 27, it talks about a person uh, issued a notice, forfeits, and must pay to the state a penalty and in the amount to be determined by a district court of not more than $10,000 per day. I don't see any kind of a cap on this. So at, at what point could, I mean, is this $10,000, is it retroactive, for instance? Uh, is there any kind of a cap? Could you actually uh, get up to $100,000 in this? I mean, what, it, well, there's nothing in here that, that stops, uh, stops this penalty. And that, and at the same time, can you answer uh, with an example of what uh, might trigger this. Senator Kunish, our testifiers. Yes, I'd like to um, ask my testifier to respond to that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Um, Chair, Ms. Senator, Ms. I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, the limit is that $10,000 per day of violation, but no, there is no limit to the overall tool. Um, if that violation were to occur for multiple days, there is no limit there. 
Um, we, I just want to acknowledge what um, a previous testifier said, that we do believe that the vast majority of uh, permittees are in compliance, and we are really reserving any kind of penalty carrying action for those egregious, serious, or, or repeated violations. So this bill gives us a spectrum of tools, those that don't have any penalties, and those that have higher penalties depending on the particular situation. Um, so yes, we have seen, as, as one of the testifiers mentioned, a large construction project that warranted a very high penalty. We do not see that happening very often or expect to see that to happen very often in other cases. However, we have seen, um, you know, for example, um, an irrigator who is irrigating without a permit and even when being given multiple cease and desist orders did not stop pumping. So reserving a variety of tools for different kinds of situations that are encountered. Mr. Chair. Green. Uh, thank you for that answer, uh, but you're not limiting this to huge, huge industrial organ, uh, operations. You, this is for everybody. And just for the record, I can take you to places, very small farmers who have been dealing with, uh, with the penalties and stuff, so, some of which uh, is not really their own fault. And, and you never also never answered, is it retroactive? I mean, can you go back in and say this has been going on for some time and, and we're going to go back in time and uh, before you even knew it happened and we're going to uh, start imposing fines? But the next question to the author is on uh, page 5, uh, 14 and 15. Um, can you explain this? Because it, uh, on the civil penalties and damages provided in this subdivision can be brought... Uh, to the Attorney General and prosecuted basically in the in Ramsey County uh, is this is this uh, going to take everything and put it into the hands of the Attorney General prosecution the State Attorney General why why bring everything to Ramsey County I don't get that Sir Kunish or uh, Miss Smith and, Ms. Smith um, I'd like Miss Smith to answer yes. please and if the answer is not thorough, it, this bill would be traveling to judiciary after this. Yep. Uh, Ms. Ms. Smith. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, as far as the, the location, um, any time, my understanding is any time that the state is, is uh, um, in defense under uh, an enforcement action, um, it's in Ramsey Court because that's where the Capitol and state offices are located. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so they're not even going to be able to go to court in their own districts. Uh, then at the bottom of page 5, uh, 28 and down, um, I'm not even going to reread it, but 28, 29, 30, and 31, can you explain to me what that means? The public Ms. nuisance. Ms. Smith, and uh, we also have to help the council to need to. So Ms. Smith, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, as I mentioned, there's a variety of tools that it would give the, this bill would give the DNR the authority to, um, to use. So if there is a violation of the, the chapter governing water appropriation, um, or if there was a violation for an administrative penalty order, a stipulation agreement, a schedule of compliance, et cetera, um, there could be a, a lawsuit that would be brought um, in the name of the state, brought by the Attorney General. Um, Okay. Mr. Chair, Ms. It, uh, what, what this bill says to me is that once again, we're, we're giving nearly unlimited power again in a different area to the commissioner of the DNR. And we're just eliminating uh, any due process, it looks like. Uh, I don't see much in here where, where uh, these uh, farmers, especially the small farmers, are going to have much of a, a chance to go defend themselves, and if, it, and if they do, it's gonna cost them thousands and thousands of dollars. This, uh, this bill I don't think is necessary, um, and I could go on, but I, I think you get the point that uh, this is just not a good bill. I, and I'll, I'll stop now and let my other colleagues in, ask questions. Okay, Senator Icorn. Mr. Chair, I think you partially answered one I had. Where, where is this going? Is this going to Ag next or Judiciary next? It will go to Judiciary next. Okay. Glad to see that. I'm, I'm 
Definitely concerned about the penalties that are in here, uh, being that there could be potential criminal prosecution for a small farmer. I mean, this is just another, feels like an attack on farmers, another micromanagement of farmers that isn't really needed. If you want to go after the big factory farmers, sure, whatever, but small farms, I, I think it's a little, a little bit excessive. Uh, for Ms. Smith, what is it, what kind of tools do you have now? What are you doing now, basically, would be the question. What tools do you have now to go after these individuals, and how, are, how do you police it now, and if this bill makes it through in its current form, how do you plan to police it? Do they self-report, or you, you send somebody from the DNR, uh, DNR out to everybody's farm to count the number of gallons somebody uses? What, what does this look like? Ms. Smith. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, so right now the DNR has administrative penalty authority. Um, but those penalties must be forgiven if the, if the corrective actions are completed. So if someone does in fact stop pumping and get a permit, they do not get a, a penalty. Um, we've only issued two of those thus far. Um, as mentioned, they're not much of a, a deterrent. They're not much of a, a threat. Um, as someone has mentioned, sometimes it's just been considered a, a cost of doing business. So if those penalties aren't non-forgivable, um, we don't see a lot of compliance um, with those particular tools. Um, but if we were to get these, these authorities, as I mentioned, it would give us a variety of tools. So like a schedule of compliance, with, which does not have an upfront penalty, but would put a violator um, on a schedule to get to compliance. So for example, do permitting, or excuse me, um, pump test or aquifer test to, to go through the process of getting a permit and getting into compliance. And compliance is the goal. It's not our goal to, to assess penalties unless it is a serious or repeat violation. So as with any new program, we would start with education, technical assistance. We want to work with folks as much as possible and not penalize anyone unless we absolutely have to. Mr. Chair, yes, um, Ms. Smith, so to me, from the statements you just made, it sounds like you already kind of have the tools you need to, to talk to these individuals, to tell them what they need to do. And the other part of the question that, and sorry if I missed it, is how, how, do you, how are you going to police this? Like, do you show up at somebody's farm and count the gallons? What, what is it you're doing to actually enforce this police? It? Uh, how does somebody even know if they're going to be, you know, outside of what they're supposed to be doing? It would be helpful for us to understand how this is actually going to work. Um, Ms. Smith, Smith, and my, my take on this bill is this is uh, uh, to, in regard to a uh, larger uh, business or larger farm owner, right? Yes. But go ahead and answer Senator Eichhorn's uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, question. Senator, um, permittees are required to, to report their water use to the DNR each year, so we rely on, on their information um, to follow up on when if they went over their permitted limit, and we would use our discretion. We would not um, pursue enforcement actions for a small amount um, of water used over their permitted limit. Um, in addition, we do receive um, complaints. Um, for example, if a neighbor runs out of water in their well because someone's appropriating um, without a permit nearby, we find out through that process as well. And just um, everyday folks um, reporting noncompliance um, from a fairness perspective. Senator Icorn. Just a comment, then I'll move on. Uh, it, it, to me, it seems like if people are going to self-report, and I'm a small farmer, and you got 100,000 gallons, and you used 150,000 gallons this month, why would you report 150 when you could just say, I used 100 again this month? It's, to me, it seems like another attack on small farmers. If you're worried about the factory farmers, maybe we should tweak the bill and go after them. But... Um, just to continually go after these small farmers. And some of them are getting out of the business because they're sick of it, being overregulated by DNR, PCA. Um, this is a little too much, too fast. Um, I think you could probably get some support, Senator Kunish, if you tailored the bill a little more towards those big corporate farms and gave some relief to the smaller farmers. That's kind of what we're hearing today from some of the uh, irrigators that this is going to be a little overburdensome. And at the end of the day, if you do this, you're probably not going to know what kind of usage they're going to have anyway. What incentive do they have not to lie to you? I mean, all you're going to do is create a scenario where it's easier to just do what they're going to do and tell you the number they're going to tell you. I don't know how you're going to police it. So I, 
definitely opposed to this at the moment. If you're willing to tweak it, you might be able to get my support later, not that you need it or want it, but this, this needs to change. I mean, this continual thing that we see attack on, on, on farmers and the things we do in greater Minnesota, it's, it's really frustrating. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Sam, Sam, Sam McHugh or Sam Hoffman? Okay. Chair, thank you, Mr. Chair. I love this conversation, it, 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 but the, the optics um, uh, are concerning if, if indeed it is what, what I'm hearing. But, but the, the reality is this. Here's the elephant in the middle of that room, right? There's a large corporation. I don't know. They're from Canada, maybe. And, and they, they made $47 billion in Canadian, uh, which is $34 billion in USA, United States of America, right? And right here, USA dollars, $34 billion. Um, I'm a farmer background, right? Raised in Hollywood Township. There's more farms. I still have one of my best pictures is where I grew up as a kid and, you know, I had a skidoo snowmobile and we used to go drive around. The thing that this bill is getting to, and, and I appreciate that, uh, is that it's going after those big, large, giant um, folks in the sandbox that don't want to get along with everybody else. And so if there's concerns that it's, it's overreached to, um, to our small Minnesota farmers, then I think maybe we should you know, look at that language and try to try to get that. But I, I'm, I'm not seeing it, and I'm not seeing what Senator Eichhorn's seeing, and, and maybe because I, I know when I'm looking at the intent of that. So, again, you know, if it's um, we're trying to fix a problem of, and, and this large corporation, I won't say who they are, but they're from Canada, um, and did I tell you that's $34 billion in, in American money that they made um, last year, you know, Perhaps, uh, you know, if you're going to be in Minnesota, why don't you work like the rest of us, Minnesota nice. And so I, I appreciate you going after that kind of aspect on it. But if there is, and I'm sure, man, you go to judiciary with this, you think, you know, I think, um, let's just say, uh, you know, you'll, I'm not going to say anything funny because I'm not funny. Today's not been a funny day, Senator Kunish, let me tell you. You know, the target I got is not okay. I just want to say that publicly here, and I'll say it publicly at every little committee I'm at. But for you, thank you for doing this. And I think if there, if you see Senator Eichhorn, if there's something in here, I think you would be willing enough to say, all right, find it so we can make sure we are protecting Minnesota farmers. And so I appreciate you at least getting this to the table and, and doing it. And, and let's move it on to where the next people, but along the way, I know how you work, and you'll be taking people's input, and I appreciate that about you. So thank you. Thank you, Sam Hoffman. Point well taken. Uh, Senator McCune. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you very much, Senator Kunish, for bringing this bill. Um, thank you to um, the DNR also for um, working um, with people who have been concerned. There are many people, including many of my constituents, who have been concerned about abuses in this regard. I understand that this language actually mirrors the authority that the MPCA already has. And I also just have to note for the record that I, if people do have concerns about the language of the bill, it's very unfortunate that we never got a hearing for this bill last year. Um, when the bill was originally filed, we could have started those discussions back then and then we'd be ready to move forward. Um, I'd like to see the bill move forward. Um, and if work continues, then, then that's fine. I'm also happy to be part of that work, Senator Kunish, if you're looking for any other people to help out. So again, thank you very much for bringing this bill. Um, if there are changes that need to happen, I'm sure and I know and I trust that you will be. You are also concerned about greater Minnesota and small family farmers, and you will make sure that this is not a bill that would hurt them. So um, trusting in that, um, Senator Herr, um, whenever you are ready, I would like to make the motion that the, this bill be recommended to pass and move forward to the next committee. Oh, that's a minute. Okay, sure. I mean, I'm ready, but uh, members still want to discuss further. Senator Wiesemer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have, I have a question on the bill. So on page five, um, if you go to line, um, like line 5.4 to 5.6, it talks about what you have to pay, but then in 5.7, it says, as a defense to damages assessed under paragraph C, a defendant may prove that the violation was caused solely by an act of God. So let's say there's a drought and you use water with that, then you wouldn't have to pay for that. Is that what that says? I think we should go council. 
to counsel on this part. <laughs> counsel Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, um, this is your question. Senator Wiesenberg is squarely within the Judiciary Committee's uh, jurisdiction. I will say these words here that you're asking about look a lot like uh, affirmative defense language and these concepts an act of God and act of war are terms of art that are used um, you know in in a context of defenses for various acts and various statutes so I think I think that's what I would say about that Senator uh, uh, thank you mr. chair yeah I, I, I guess I just read it that way I well I guess we'll find out so okay. all right thank you Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will be quick. I know we've burned up a lot of time here. Uh, and I understand Senator Hoffman's words there that, that the intent of the bill, and I hear that a lot, the intent of the bill, but if the intent of the bill is not to harm small farmers, then the language should have been in there. Because it's, it's very broad, like the bill coming up next. And, in, and just, you know, the, the power and authority that we're given the commissioners, they can decide these things on their own. And that's just, that's not even uh, acceptable I don't think to a lot of people that uh, a commissioner can now say this is right, this is wrong without any due process. And I do think that this bill should be, should be uh, pulled or at least had some major reconstruction in it to uh, target small biz or big businesses if that's what it's supposed to be going after. Because I can tell you, I work a lot with the irrigators and, and a lot of small farmers and they hold their breath every time uh, the DNR or the MPCA comes around. And I've said it many times, the DNR in, in northern Minnesota is a four-letter word. And, uh, and so they're just not welcome there at all. And this is, this is the reason why. Mr. Chair, I'll, I've got yes. one more comment, if I may. Senator um, to, to Senator Green's point, this is pretty broad. And there is also some concern, um, you know, PCA already has some of this authority, which that's a different discussion. But what would what would stop the DNR from using this language to shut down or impede other type of operations they oppose, whether it be mining, forestry, or other industrial pursuits? Um, you, some of these industries could have some of this regulatory stuff coming at them from both fronts. Again, if we could more narrowly tailor this to those large factory farms that you seem to be worried about. I think that would provide a lot of comfort. And to Senator Green's point about the DNR being a four letter word, it's, you know, in, in Northern Minnesota especially, that's really true. There's a reason, you know, the DNR has earned that distrust, unfortunately. And I would love to see that trust earned again. And unfortunately, stuff like this isn't gonna help it. So I'm gonna have to be opposed today. And I'm, I'm glad it's gonna to continue to move to other committees. I think judiciary is certainly a good spot for it. Get a chance to see it again there. I hope Senator Kunish, you'll take some of the comments to heart and work with some of the players as it moves between committees. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Senator McHugh. Just briefly, I just wanna make sure that this is added to the record that um, there are some communities in Minnesota for whom um, there is a crisis in trust with our agencies, not because their regulations are too strong, but because there are a number of instances where people feel that they have not stood up to protect our water when it was being requested by the people of this state. And so um, I, I, understand that in several of those instances, the answer from various agencies has been, well, we do not have the power to do that. I hope that we get this right and then we make sure that our agencies do have the power that they need to protect the water for the people of the state of Minnesota. With, um, and Mr. Chair, I, I will make the motion when you're ready. Yes, point vote well taken, Senator McEwen, um, on your point and also your, your motion. A closing remark from Senator McEwen, and we're go, going to go back to the motion uh, made by Senator, uh, close remark by Senator Kunish, then we're going to go back to Senator McEwen for the motion. Senator Th Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, this, this bill is in no way um, in um, an attempt to micromanage or punish farmers or those who use their permits, who apply for the permits, who use their permits accountably. And um, should they need more water, there is always the opportunity to use those dollars or those money, 
those uh, permits to, to get the water that they need under whatever situation they are under. And as Senator McEwen um, says, there are a few large organizations and corporations that have used and abused um, our water and our permitting, and that's why this, is, uh, this bill is here. And so with that, I would ask you to send it on. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator Kunish. Um, Senator McHugh moves that Senate File 2458 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Judiciary Committee. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. As, as amended, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion prevail. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Kunish. And next, uh, Senator McHugh. You ready? Okay. Senator McHugh has uh, Senate File 2703, Sustainable Division of Limits Provision on Groundwater Appropriation. Okay. Anytime you're ready, Senator McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, um, Senate File 2703 is a bill to ensure that Minnesota's water resources are protected and available for current and future generations of Minnesotans. As we know, long-term overuse of groundwater can significantly affect our wetlands, lakes, and streams. This bill defines ecosystem harm, negative impact to surface water, and sustainable diversion limits in the context of water use and current Minnesota water laws. The proposed definitions are based on the DNR's definitions and thresholds for negative impacts to surface waters report to the legislature in 2016. The bill clarifies that groundwater appropriation permits may only be issued if they avoid known negative impacts to surface waters and provides the DNR authority to establish sustainable diversion limits to avoid negative surface water impacts. A handful of other states in the eastern half of the U.S. have implemented similar approaches to setting diversion limits to protect surface waters and aquatic ecosystems. The bill will ensure that we have a clear and transparent framework that balances reasonable use with long-term sustainability. And with that, Mr. Chair, members, um, I will um, turn it over to our testifiers. Ms. Smith, welcome. Stay your name for the record for this bill. Mr. Chair, members, Katie Smith, Director of the Ecological and Water Resources Division at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Um, the variability of Minnesota's climate and geography mean that rainfall is not always available in the quantities we need at the times when we most need it. Um, Minnesota businesses and communities need dependable and reliable water supplies. While water levels fluctuate naturally throughout the year and across multiple years, intensive water appropriation can push the low levels lower more often, significantly reducing stream flows and more frequently putting fish, wildlife, plant communities, and riparian uses at risk. Our ecosystems are important to Minnesotans' way of life and to our recreational economy. Therefore, DNR is proposing some revisions and additions in statute that relate to water management. The proposed changes were described in a report, as Senator McEwen said, to the legislature in 2016 after extended stakeholder discussions over several months, and we can make that threshold report available to the, the committee. A little about the bill components, it adds definitions and statute that define negative impact, ecosystem harm, and sustainable diversion limits, modifies statutory language for authorizing groundwater use by incorporating those definitions when considering groundwater appropriations, and while the st current statutory language for ground groundwater use requires protection of surface water ecosystems, it lacks clear definitions of what constitutes a negative impact. The proposed additions and revisions are a recognition of the fact that many of Minnesota's surface waters are, are hydraulically connected to groundwater resources. The surface water provisions in Chapter 103G.285 are related to, related to direct appropriation of surface water and can be managed by suspending permits under certain conditions. Permit suspension does not translate in a meaningful way to the diffuse and distributed impacts of groundwater use. The delay between action and response in water levels is too slow. It could be weeks, months, or years, and adds a great deal of uncertainty for groundwater users. There's a strong scientific basis for maintaining the natural dynamic patterns of surface water bodies by establishing protected flows for individual streams, protection elevations for individual basins, and target hydrographs for wetlands. So um, implementation, what might that look like? Um, the sustainable diversion limit would be defined in terms of a protected flow or elevation for one or more water features. 
A groundwater model will be used to determine whether existing and or proposed cumulative groundwater withdrawals in the area, drawing from a combination of sources including stream flow and aquifers, are likely to exceed the sustainable diversion limit. If sustainable diversion limits are exceeded or are likely to be exceeded, then the DNR would establish a planning process involving stakeholders and permittees to evaluate water use priorities and determine options to adjust appropriations and stay below the diversion limit. Individual appropriation permits would be assessed in relation to the cumulative limit, and if necessary, appropriation permits would be adjusted at specified intervals so that the cumulative withdrawal limit is not exceeded. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, on, 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 on our agenda here is also Tony uh, Killas, but uh, Mr. Con oh, he's here. <laughs> okay, all right. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna mix it up on you today, yeah, uh, this yeah. afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, my name is Tony Kulis. Um I'm representing the Irrigators Association of Minnesota. I want to start out by thanking, even though it was very brief yesterday, Senator McEwen and I had a conversation about Senate File 2703, and I'd also like to thank uh, the DNR. We've had some preliminary conversations with them also. But Mr. Chairman, when we talk about groundwater appropriation permits, I think it's important to think of the entities that possess these. There's, we've had some discussion today around the agriculture industry, but also um, cities, municipalities, and industrial facilities also have these permits. And to think of that wide variety there, but then also uh, when you think about the state of Minnesota, southeastern Minnesota is different than northern Minnesota. The metropolitan area is different than uh, central Minnesota. So you've got to take those factors and put them in that the variety of folks that have these permits and the variety that we have in Minnesota in terms of our geographic areas, and then look at that when we put these into the definitions that we just talked about. Ecosystem harm, negative impact to surface waters, and sustainable diversion limit. But I'd like to focus on ecosystem harm because then that folds into the other two below it. I just think when you look at specifically on 1.9 of the bill, Mr. Chairman, where it talks about a loss of ecological structure or function. That just seems to be a very broad term. It doesn't have any timeline or time frame around it, whether it's permanent or temporary, whether it's seasonal or whether it's potential or actual. Um, ecological structure, function, or loss. So it just, it creates uncertainty among regulated uh, entities. And so we'd like to keep working with Senator McEwen and the Department of Natural Resources to try and provide some clarity around that term specifically, but also with the two below it. Because when we model this, we want to make sure that we've got peer-reviewed, scientifically-based data to go through and make, back up that modeling before we go through and start um, looking at um, some of these other um, impacts. Because like I said, we have the same shared goal. We all want to protect the groundwater and our surface water interaction, but we want to make sure to provide some clarity for the regulated entity. So Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Again, even though it was brief yesterday, Senator McEwen and I had a conversation, um, but thank you for the opportunity to uh, comment on Senate File 2703. Thank you, Mr. Collis. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of these times I'm going to wait for somebody else to raise their hand, but then if they don't, you'll pass me by, so I got to worry about that. And Senator Green, you're a quick draw. <laughs> you're quicker than all of us. So go ahead, Senator uh, I do have concerns with this bill, and one of the things that I, I noticed when I first read this bill that there's no penalties in this bill, and then I realized that the bill we just heard has the penalties in it. And, and now here again, this, this broad uh, explanation of, of what these terms mean, and uh, the testifier from the DNR said that this is to uh, define ecosystem harm, but actually it does not do that. It just basically makes it anything. Anything can be ecosystem harm. Uh, um, anything that affects aquatic ecosystem harm or riparian uh, use long term. That could be anything. It could be a, a speck of dust, I guess, for that, for that matter. And on, and on the back plate, uh, too, uh, negative impacts to water surfaces. What does that even mean? It could mean anything. It could mean stepping in the water with a, with a uh, boot you just came out of the feedlot with because, because there is no definition. And so uh, if I'm wrong, can you tell me 
what the objective standards are going to be for these definitions. Um, Senator McHugh, our testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will go ahead and defer to my testifiers, and if I have anything to add, I will. Okay, please state your name for the record. Mr. Chair and committee members, for the record, Jason Meckle, I'm a section manager, uh, Department of Natural, Natural Resources, Division of Ecological and Water Resources, and um, I was the managing sponsor for the report that was referred to. Um, Senator Green, to, to speak to your question, um, the context of this is that we're talking about appropriation permit decisions. So the only thing that's at question is whether or not the authorized use of water is going to result in something in the stream. So the determination is, have we, by authorizing that use of water, caused there to be less water in the stream sufficient to cause ecological harm? And what we're offering here is that we look at the ecological structure and function of that stream ecosystem. And in the report, we went into detail about that. It's really about the loss of habitat. If we lose water in a stream often enough, in, in a big enough magnitude, we lose habitats that are important to the fish community, the insect community that live in that system. That's what we're trying to avoid. Mr. Chair. So uh, with that said, then, we, we were talking about irrigators and farmers, but someone mentioned uh, uh, point source as well. So two things then. One, would the fines uh, from the previous bill uh, be carried over into this? And does it also uh, include not just farmers, but also uh, public utilities, cities, uh, counties, wastewater, or I mean uh, landfills, wastewater treatments? Are those also included in this, uh, these definitions? Uh, Senator McEwen and Senator Green, just a little information beforehand. Uh, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in the environmental policy bill. So, Senator McEwen, our testifier. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Senator, uh, again, this comes back to a decision to authorize the use of water or not. That's, that's the statute that we're talking about where these sustainable diversion limits are applied. So it's not about um, the other aspects. That it's just simply the permit itself. It doesn't have to do with a violation or not a violation. It's just our decision to authorize that activity and trying to create some transparency and accountability uh, so we can be held accountable for what decisions we're making in a way that makes sense. So one more thing, me? Mr. Chair, and then I'll stop. Uh, so you're saying that uh, should there be a violation, uh, then there would be no fine? And also uh, um, that these would not affect, you know, none of these bills are going to affect uh, public water systems, what treatments at plants that might end up in the water supply for uh, permitting. Me. Could you pull a permit uh, of, a, of a city, for instance, or, uh, or a wastewater treatment or, or even a landfill? Mr. McComb. Mr. Chair and, and members, in reviewing whether it's a city permit or an agricultural irrigation permit, uh, we already take into consideration, is there going to be an impact on surface water resource? What this is doing is clarifying the standard on which we're going to do that. That's what we spent months talking about with this in the stakeholder group. There was so much concern about the lack of definition of a negative impact. What did that mean? And we, we went through the scientific literature and we met with these stakeholder groups. We talked about we had 56 technical experts and 27 representatives of various interest groups at the table for months, I'm reminded months, <laughs> from those that were there to work through all this material and, and lay out the basis for it. It's part of a permit decision to authorize or potentially to amend if we discover that there is a problem. Senator Green. Uh, it still, it still is broad. And, and so even if you have a report there that, that does define what a negative impact is, in law you do not. And with the discretion being given to the commissioners here, they can change that in midstream if they want, as I understand it. So uh, your report doesn't, doesn't reflect the law uh, as far as what the negative impact could mean should you change, or should the commissioner decide that he's gonna change that. That's all, it's just a comment, thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion, Senator Lane? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess 
Um, I understand the, the concept behind the bill. I understand what the, the agency was going for, but um, kind of going along the same questioning lines as Senator Green. And it looks like subdivision two is kind of the most important portion of the bill other than the definitions. But is that only to groundwater or does it apply to, to you know, large bodies of surface water? Because I think if it does, and, and let me actually go ahead and answer that question. I don't know if, they, if Senator McEwen knows or... <laughs> Mr. Chair and members, uh, it doesn't apply to surface waters. There are statutes under the surface water provisions okay. already that address what you can do for lakes, rivers, and streams and protecting low flows. The challenge that we've had, and, and Director Smith spoke to this, when you have a surface water appropriation, you're literally taking the water directly out of that feature. We already will, at times during low flow, suspend the use of water. We did dur during the last two droughts. We've had to do that to protect mm -hmm. those flows and to protect downstream uses. The trouble is when you're appropriating water from the ground, you can make a decision to spend the use of that water, but it may not have an effect for months, weeks, or years, and it's not a very effective tool. So what we want to do is establish what is sustainable, what can be done during any kind of conditions, including drought, so that there is certainty for the parties involved. And for the agricultural irrigators, that's really important, not having to be shut off during the summer, having a reliable supply of water, knowing what they can count on this year, next year, and the year after is really important. We've learned that through all of our stakeholder meetings. And, Certainly. And I, I'm just, one more time, just trying to clarify that it doesn't affect, you know, you mentioned surface waters, lake, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is lake associations. You know, we spend hundreds of million dollars you know, removing bogs from a lake, and that certainly affects surface water. Uh, I would call it a positive change, but it definitely affects ecosystems in the same way. Uh, then when it comes to Lassard Sands, I mean, we spend $100 million plus dollars every year changing the course of waterways and, you know, trying to enhance and store and protect, right? But I'm sure there's steps in that that are harming the ecosystem in the process. So we're kind of as long as it's talking about groundwater, not really talking about those surface waters, I think we're okay, but I don't know. I, maybe a little clarification on that, just so you, you don't, I, I think we're this close because on subdivision two, it, you know, then you talk about the relationship, but prior to that, you're giving those definitions, so. Mr. Michael. Mr. Chair and members, yeah, the, that is, you hit the important point there, Senator, that this is the subdivision two that is specifically under the groundwater appropriations, the groundwater provisions and statute. And it's about just getting some language that gives us some clarity around setting that sustainable diversion limit rather than relying on what is considered a protected flow, which operates like a shutoff switch during the season. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, Senator McEwen, uh, closing remark on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for our experts who have been working so hard on this. This really is about that reliability piece. We all uh, rely on clean water. Our industry relies on it, our businesses, our municipalities, our people. And this is about making the best decisions possible to make sure that it's sustainable into the long term. So I ask for your support. Thank you. Um, Senator McEwen and we lay over Senate file. 2703 for possible inclusion in an environment policy on a bus bill. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to arrange our. Oh, okay. We'll stick with McCune. Uh, Senator McCune, Senate File 1683, uh, requirement modification, notify water pollution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, this bill requires wastewater plant operators to notify the public and downstream communities and drinking water facilities if an unauthorized wastewater discharge occurs. It also requires postings of signs at any public use areas, such as parks or public right-of-way areas, um, that are directly impacted by a release of untreated or partially treated wastewater. The MPCA developed this policy language with wastewater operators and other stakeholders. This proposal also directs the MPCA to provide guidance that wastewater operators can use to comply with this provision. And with that, Mr. Chair, um, I also have somebody here to testify to the bill. Well, welcome, and uh, please state your name for the record. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dana Vanderbosch. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Water Policy and Agriculture at the MPCA. And thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, today on Senate File 1683. This is one of the MPCA's policy bills for 2023, and the MPCA is supportive of the bill as introduced. Um, as Senator McEwen mentioned, the bill will require municipalities to notify the public and downstream drinking water facilities in the event that there's a, a release of untreated or partially treated um, sewage uh, to our state waters. And the bill will also require the posting of signage if the overflow impacts a public use area, such as a park, a recreation area, or a beach or a waterfront area. Current rules require facilities to report releases to the Minnesota duty officer, but they do not require notification to downstream drinking water authorities or to the public. The cause of these releases range from overflows due to clogged sewer mains to major releases caused by heavy rains that overwhelm wastewater collection systems and cause untreated wastewater to flow to Minnesota's lakes, streams, public spaces, and private properties every year. Between 2010 and 2021, an average of 200 such releases per year were reported. 75% of them are due to uh, wet weather. When these releases occur, they carry bacteria and other harmful substances that pose a threat to human health. So it's really critical that downstream communities and the public are made aware of such situations when they happen. The proposed bill language is similar to Wisconsin's statutory requirement and was developed in coordination with municipal wastewater stakeholders, um, included representatives from the League of Minnesota Cities, the Coalition, Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, the Minnesota Environmental Science and Economic Review Board, the Met Council, Minnesota Rural Water, Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association, Minnesota Small Cities, and the Public Facilities Authority. My understanding is that the League of Minnesota Cities sent a letter in support of this bill. Um, I'm not sure if that was circulated, but I do know that Craig Johnson is here in the audience if, if you'd like him to come up and testify. We appreciate Senator McEwen's bringing this bill forward, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from members? Uh, Senator Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the only, the only question, I don't, I don't think this is a bad way, but maybe just the, you mentioned it was for municipalities, but there is an, on line 1.17, it talks about privately owned yeah. septic tanks. Yep. Um, not that it's a bad idea, but it's probably a little burdensome on the private homeowner to, I, I don't know, I don't know what kind of success you would have implementing a law and having that private home, homeowner provide notice. or. To be honest with you, I don't know what kind of impact you possibly could have. I, I, in, if they're subject to the law, they're subject to the law, but I think maybe there's a spot there. Yep. Yeah, Senator McEwen and our test five, Ms. Uh, Menabal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Lang. Thanks for that question. Yes, this came up in the House hearing as well. And private septic systems or SSTS systems are really not subject to this law. This law is really intended to apply to publicly owned treatment works and then um, private, um, private um, mobile homes and housing developments that are discharging into a publicly owned treatment system. So we did have uh, legal staff go and take a look at the definition of a public um, collection system and a private individual septic system that one would operate within their home does not fall within the law. Sand Lane, you good? Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? If not, Senator McCune, closing remark. Thank you. I'm, I'm just very pleased to um, have been approached to carry this bill. And, um, we, we have a right to know uh, when, when our drinking water um, might uh, be affected by a discharge like this. And, and with um, climate change now upon us um, and increased intense weather events, also uh, rain events, we are forecast to have to see more of these, unfortunately. So it's going to be a very important piece of the public right to know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah McEwen. And we'll lay over Senate File 1683 for possible inclusion in the environment policy on a bus bill. Thank you. Yep, thank you. And members, um, we're a little short of time, so we're going to maybe move two bills to tomorrow. 
uh, but we want to hear policy bill that will be laid over for possible inclusion. So I will uh, rearrange the bill, the order of the bill a little bit, uh, and that was starting with uh, Senator House Child um, going next, uh, but Senator Fowl, 694, and then uh, follow that will be my bill. Uh, we're trying to get this done before uh, three, I mean, before five, 520 or 525, you know, some of us has a meeting at 530, so um, we're trying to get it as much as we can. If After this two bill, if you have time, we can uh, pick on another bill, but we'll see. So Senate House Charles, um, on to Senate File 694, muzzle loader uh, provision. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. We'll try to go quickly. Uh, this is Senate File 694, which modernizes Minnesota's definition of a muzzle loader to keep pace with technology developed right here in Minnesota by federal ammunition and clarifies statutes that a muzzle loader can be charged through its breach. Other states are amending their game and fish regulations to accommodate this new technology with increases in safety for muzzle loading and encouraging additional hunters to purchase a muzzle loading season license. Senate file 694 is supported by the DNR and has strong bipartisan support. With me today is Dan Compton with Visit Vista Outdoor, who can answer any technical questions you might have. Okay, are you here to testify as well? Or just answer? Uh, either way, so my name is Dan Compton. I'm here on behalf of Vista Outdoor. Uh, Mr. Chair and Committee, thank you for the opportunity. And I will take the time to answer any questions if you have them at this time. Okay, any questions from member Senator Wiesenberg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is addressing the new muzzle loader, nit the nitro muzzle loader that just came out a few years ago, correct? Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, nitro fire and Federal's fire stick. Uh, so uh, so uh, I believe this is just going to clarify the language so people can, because right now there's confusion that people think they can't use this, but we're clearing the, finding the language to make sure that they know they can, and I think that's what this is, right? Yes, Mr. Chair and Senator, that is, that is okay. correct. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, obviously, I supported the bill, signed on to it. I think there's a mistake in it, though, that I actually just caught as I was sitting here. Um, and the only reason I'm saying this is because when it comes to muzzle loaders, there's kind of a, and this is probably for the benefit of the committee more than anything, but they're kind of an odd weapon. Uh, you, you oftentimes leave them loaded when you're moving them, uh, minus primer, just to, uh, well, because you don't want to shoot a round off. Uh, really is what is what the uh, the purpose of that is you don't want to you don't want it to completely unload it's the removal of the primer so if you look on line 1.14 um, I'm, I'm just going to offer a verbal amendment I don't know if Senator Hoschild is okay with this but for an encapsulated powder charge and use the system the primer uh, and strike and powder charge uh, are removed from a firearm I think the primer is the the important part the powder charge uh, oftentimes with the round is left into the in the in the weapon so and that was something I, when I looked at it, I'm like, yep, this is, this is good. And I never caught that before until now two months later down the road, here I am. So, <laughs> so how's John? Uh, Chair, her, uh, Senator Lang, thank you for catching this. I will be completely honest. I am not an expert in this, so I might defer possibly to, to, uh, to someone else just to, uh, but I am open to <laughs> what you're saying. Yeah, the bill. Colonel, uh, state your name for the record and... Uh, uh, I think this is, do you, remark. is this just an oral, sorry, Chair Her, yeah. um, yeah. Senator Lang, is this an oral amendment or do you I, have I just it? caught it as I was okay. sitting here. Okay, so I don't think it's this. Uh, for the record, Colonel Rodman Smith, uh, Director of Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, Mr. Chair, could you please re repeat the oral amendment? Yes, uh, Mr. Stanley will repeat it for us. Mr. Chair, I think Senator Lang is moving on page one, line 14, to delete the words and powder charge. No. No. And, and Mr. Chair, just for explanation, I, I think the important part is removing the primer from the weapon as it's transported or stored for that matter. That really the storage is just as important. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Colonel. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lane, that's a good catch. So if you're looking at one line 1.14, so it would be the last three words on there, and powder charge, I, I think that's a good catch. Yes, and, and I suppose, uh, are you changing? Yes, too. 
Is this is? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> okay, we're going to mark that, and I think there's a little grammar. So, Mr. Chair, the amendment is on page one, line 14, to delert the, delete the words and powder charge, and on page one, line 15, to delete the word are and insert is. Good catch, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm I normally don't, I'm not good with my, um, let me see, uh, my grammar when I speak, but uh, when writing come, I'm very no so noticeable when there's <laughs> plural or singular, so <laughs> here's the singular. So members, everybody got that? Okay, got the amendment. All in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye, say aye. Okay, opposed, nay. Uh, motion prevail. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, any further discussion? Okay, that's uh, give us a closing remark, uh, Senator House Child on 694. No, no closing remarks, Chair. I'll give you your time back. Thank you so much. Okay, so we will lay over uh, Senate File 694 uh, as amended uh, for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Environmental Policy Bill. Okay, next uh, we'll jump to, into mine, and if we have time later we'll see if Senate, we can hear Senate House Child Bill. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'll pass my gavel to Senator McCune. We'll do Senate File 2116. The, that's the environmental that's uh, 2116. Look, uh, what's the title of that? Oh, big and licenses. Yep. Senator Hur to your bill. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair McEwen and members. Uh, Senate File 2116 is a technical non controversial bill. It removes a loophole in the current law where a person will be able to buy a license before being convicted of certain game and fish law violations, and the license will be valid. I'll turn over to Colonel uh, Rodman Smith from the DNR to talk more about the bill and answer any questions. Welcome to the committee. If you'd introduce yourself for the record, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Colonel Rodman Smith, Director of Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members, um, I'd like to thank uh, Chair Her for bringing this forward. This is a loophole um, that we've uh, uh, encountered over the years. And so um, this is for the most egregious of a violations. And so if you have a gross over and limit, um, of, of game um, where the restitution value reaches a certain threshold. This isn't like one deer over a limit. We're talking multiple. These are the big gross over limit things. Um, in current statute, um, upon um, the arrest, you, uh, officers can seize the licenses of the person they can't hunt anymore until there's a conviction. And the current language says you can't, um, uh, um, you can't, uh, Obtain any big game license, and so um, what we want uh, prior to conviction, and so we still have some people that are able to loophole through this um, and go out and still hunt, and so this is just kind of closing that loophole for that real small fraction of people that are those gross over limits that are are gaming the system prior to conviction, because sometimes these things can stretch out over a year, um, especially some of the larger cases, and so this is just uh, closing that loop. Thank you for your testimony. And we have another testifier at the table. If you could introduce yourself for Thank the record, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Darren Lee with uh, Flaherty and Hood on behalf of the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. Uh, we want to express our appreciation to Senator Herr for bringing this forward um, and the members of the committee for hearing the bill. We strongly believe that this bill reflects the in original intent of the law and recognize that a few bad actors 
uh, taking advantage of a perceived loophole is not good for hunting in Minnesota or Minnesota as a whole. And so we uh, want to express our support. Thank you, Madam Chair. We uh, would love to be a resource if needed if the bill moves forward, as the bill moves forward. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, is there any, uh, are there any other testifiers? All right, it looks like that's all that we had. Uh, members, any questions? No, it's being laid over. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess the, the one question would be, obviously, I want to know the story of what the heck happened on this one, but uh, we wouldn't be here if there wasn't a story. But um, I'm a little concerned about the guilty before being proven guilty. Is there, I mean, are we setting ourselves up for a lawsuit here if we say, you don't have the rights of a citizen prior to being convicted? I don't know, and I'm sure there is a story and there's probably extenuating circumstances, but. Madam Chair? Yes, after, yes. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Lang, that's already under existing law. And so this is just closing that loophole a little bit. So we're really not changing um, the foundation of what this does. It's just closing the minor loophole of a technicality. and so. Currently, we're, we already have that in process, and it's been in process probably for, or been in place for probably 15 years, um, this gross over limit law, and so we're just closing this little loophole. So this really isn't changing much. Okay. It, it, I, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess the question is then, right now in statute, you have the ability to revoke a license immediately? Colonel? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Lane, yes. Okay. On a gross, over, gross violation. Very good, thank you. Uh, any other questions or discussion members? Yes. So Madam, Madam Chair, is this, what's the, the disposition of the same bill in the House? Do you know Senator Herr? Senator Herr? I, I, I believe it's been heard, but I, I, have, I can check that and get back to you. So Madam, Madam yes, Chair, it, so it's not sitting on general registry over there because, and this bill doesn't have to go to judiciary, correct? Correct, I, it will be laid over. Colonel, Colonel, Colonel Rodman, uh, remember 10 years ago? <laughs> All right, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have to reinvent that, that again. So thank you. This is great. Thank you for all your work, by the way. I appreciate you and, and the work that you do um, with this stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. I was going to say move it to the floor, but the disposition of this is you're probably going to lay this over, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you, Sen Senator Hoffman, for forewarning this in case it go to a different route. But it uh, looks like it's going to move to a safer route, and uh, it's just going to close a loophole, a technical change, and mm -hmm. ask member to support. And Madam Chair, um, anytime you can motion for layover. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Hurd. Thank you for your testimony, Colonel. And I will have to ask Senator Hoffman about the 10-year reference at some later point. Um, with that, Senate File 2116 is laid over for possible inclusion in the environmental omnibus bill. So um, the time is five fourteen. Senator Herr. It's um. We can hear my um, water uh, council bill. Yeah. Of Senate File nineteen eighteen, Senator Herr. Yep. Nineteen eighteen. Let's let's hear that bill, and uh, if we um, get to if we don't have enough time, we can. Uh, Postpone till tomorrow. Can I get this? Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, after you, um, Senator Herr, to your bill. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Legislative Water Commission was established in 1989 to oversee programs created under the Comprehensive Wa Groundwater Protection Act. And the commissioners. The commission's responsibility included all aspects of water planning. The commission review agency program, held hearing, reviewed report, conducted research, and made re recommendation in order to assist the legislature in, effect, in, in effective protection and management of Minnesota water resources. The commission was ab abolished in 1996. Uh, we are unable to understand why. In 2014, the, the Legislative Water Commission was reinstated. The commission expiration date was not extended in 2019 session. We believe in just uh, it. We believe it just slipped through the crack at the end of the session. 
There did not seem to be any opposition to the commission, to my knowledge. However, the Legislative Coordinated Commission, LCC, passed a resolution in June of 2019 in 2021 and in January to continue the work as the LCC subcom subcommittee on Minnesota water policy. This resolution expired in January of 2025. The subcommittee co consists of 12 members equally balanced between bodies and parties. Uh, this will be, this will reestablish re the subcommittee as a commission with a sunset date in five years. Um, why this is important? The subcommittee serves several purposes. It creates a forum so that members can learn and discuss water-related issues in more detailed way than is possible during committee hearings. It provides members with information from agency reports in a concise manner and cutting to the chase. It serves as a vehicle for constituents and stakeholders to bring water-related issues to the legislators. It provides way to coordinate between the House and the Senate. This year, we explore over 50 water-related issues and have introduced 12 bills and advise others about several other bills. Finally, finally the establishment of the commission within a five-year sunset is important in hiring the next director. The director's role is critical to making the commission's work of value to the legislature. Currently, the LCC subcommission, the subcommittee needs to be reestablished every two years. Experienced water scientists are in demand. If the commission is reestablished, a director will soon be needed to be recruited. A two-year position simply does not provide sufficient incentive for an experienced candidate to leave the existing job. And Madam Chair, I do have testifier uh, to speak on, on this. Uh, I have a list here, Senator yep. Hurt. Would you like me to follow the list? Yes, please do. Uh, I have Mr. Jim Stark. That followed by Craig Johnson, and then we also have Dr. Lawrence Baker remotely. Welcome to the committee, gentlemen. Um, if you could please introduce yourself for the record, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair, members, and Senator, uh, thank you. The Senator explained this as well as I could have. So I'll just leave you with this. Um, a little bit about the appropriation. Uh, the, my, my name is Jim Stark. I'm the director of the Subcommittee on Water Policy currently. Um, the Senator described this well. Uh, I would just say, with regard to the appropriation, uh, the, the appropriation for the subcommittee is included in the Legislative Coordinating Commission's budget. Um, the commission would be funded through that same light item, so the impact on budget is neutral given this change. And with that, thank you, and uh, I can stand for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Craig Johnson with the League of Minnesota Cities. My comments can be very brief. Um, one of the reasons I'm up here is because I've been around as long as the Legislative Water Commission was. I started in the same year, and I'm still here, too. So um, what I just wanted to speak on behalf of, and I did support this when it was recreated uh, back in uh, 2014, um, is that this is a really valuable resource for those of us who have programs that we rely on at the state that deal with water. This creates a pool of 12 sitting legislators, six in each body, and equally split between parties that get really well versed in all of the programs going on and all of the controversy and all of the technology developments that are happening in water issues. And I think if you talk to any member who served on this, they will tell you how much they've gained from their time that they served on this. And that, in turn, makes it a lot easier for us when we come to you as a committee and as a body to have those people serving here that know the programs and have been in part of the discussion with us stakeholders as we bring it to them during the interim to discuss the issues. And I think pretty much all the stakeholders 
Um, you know, it takes a lot of time to work with this group, but we find that it does pay a good reward in having better informed members to work with. So appreciate the support the legislature has given for this in the past and hope it continues. Thank you for your testimony. And last, uh, we have Dr. Lawrence Baker remotely. And thank you very much um, to the testifiers for keeping your testimony brief. We are trying to vacate this room in about three and a half, four minutes. So to you, um, Dr. Baker, welcome to the committee. If you'd introduce yourself, we look forward to your testimony. I'm uh, uh, Larry Baker, and I've recently retired from the University of Minnesota. I've been working on water issues for about 40 years, uh, over 100 publications, um, this sort of thing. Um, my uh, thoughts are also uh, driven by an interest in good governance, uh, especially uh, when I participated in the Citizens League Water Policy Study Committee back in 2009. We developed a, re a report on, uh, that focused on uh, the gaps in, in water governance, and that's always been in the back of my mind as I do the, the, the science. I've also attended most of the sessions. I retired recently, and I've attended the sessions of the Legislative Subcommittee over the past uh, two years. So I'm basing this, uh, my testimony as an outsider's observation um, of uh, yeah, this. Um, Minnesota has uh, traditionally been water rich and we've taken this for granted. Uh, we can't do this any longer. The water resources are being jeopardized by increasing municipal use, uh, depletion of groundwater, uh, groundwater contamination, increasing irrigation, habitat destruction, all made more difficult by a rapidly changing uh, climate, I would say more uncertain of the climate. Um, you heard some of these arguments today about uh, uh, the need for new uh, water governments. Um, we must develop, much of our uh, policy has been developed 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and it was 20th century, we have a 20th century structure, and we need to have a 21st century uh, structure. Uh, we need to evolve, so we need to have these discussions in a group like this um, we need to take them very, very seriously. I've attended most of the meetings of the Legislative uh, uh, Subcommittee on Water Policy, uh, mostly by uh, remote. Uh, throughout this, I've observed uh, cordial bipartisan, bipartisan exchange among the legislators, extensive testimony from top water experts, uh, agency staff, university professors, watershed directors, and, and many others, uh, resulting in, in numerous thoughtful bills written by the subcommittee legislators. In my opinion, uh, again, thinking from a governance standpoint, the subcommittee is an exemplar of good governance. It's the right thing to be doing. Given these circumstances, I think that elevating the subcommittee to a commission, which would give the five-year term a more permanent director, would help this group become even more effective. It would also give the public greater visibility of water government governance, something that is badly needed to deal with our water problems in the future. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you to all of the testifiers. And um, we have um, just about a minute left. Members, um, do we have any discussion or questions on this bill? Senate file 1918. OK, not seeing any. Um, Senator, do you have some quick closing remarks? And would you like to make a motion to move your bill to the state and local government committee? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion uh, to this bill, Senate File 1918, to the state and local government. Um, yep. Okay. Thank you, Senator Herr. On that motion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The motion passes. Thank you, Senator Herr and um, members. Um, we are unfortunately going to have to move Senate file 2769, Senator House Child's bill to Thursday, and we have a full calendar on Thursday and also a hearing set for Friday. Um, and with Senator Hur's permission, I will adjourn the committee so that we can vacate the room and allow for the next committee to come in. Thank you very much, Senator McEwen. And please adjourn. Very good. All right. Thank you. The committee is adjourned.